Good morning and thank you all for joining me today. It's great to have a chance to talk about an issue that concerns everyone, cybersecurity. But for the harm that cyber hacking can cause, little has been done at the instrumentation level. It's all been the responsibility of industrial IT. We at Unite Electric Controls believe that instrumentation can do its part to complement the effort to make it a safer place for all. From our view, the IT solutions from control system suppliers have done an admirable job to develop the deploy solutions that meet the stringent security standards. But it may not be enough, given the huge number of potential hackers, vulnerability of older systems, and so forth. Our story is going to begin by looking at how really dangerous the landscape is while highlighting vulnerabilities of the industrial control systems. We are going to discuss hazards, risks, impacts, and cyber attacks. We will analyze why software is not enough to guard against cyber attacks and discuss technologies that are hack proof and how you would use them. At the end of the presentation, you'll understand how to proceed and how to make your plant safer as early as tomorrow. So let's begin. We're really in a dangerous landscape. First of all, we are living on borrowed time. Did you know that the attacks are growing every year, that, even, that, that 200 significant incidents actually happened in the last six months? You can see the attacks are really spread across a broad spectrum of different industries. And what's really important is that the energy infrastructure is the most important target. Now this data comes from uh, the Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team. Very hard to say quickly. And which is called ICS CERT, which is part of Homeland Security. Now, what, what they do is they work to reduce risk across all of the infrastructure. They partner with law enforcement. They partner with intelligence communities, things like that. They, they coordinate efforts among federal, state, different agencies. And really, what's more important for us is they work with control system owners, operators, and vendors, and they share uh, shared things, uh, vulnerabilities, and also mitigation strategies for, for a lot of us. And so if, if you want to learn more about this, this is their site. And uh, there's a lot of good information about how to make your plant safer. And I think this is a really good first step for anyone. Now. Just to show you how dangerous the uh, landscape really is, I want to show a really short clip, a uh, stage simulated attack. It's called Aurora, and it's on a standby power generator, and it was done by the Idaho National Laboratory. And in November 2009, uh, the TV show 60 Minutes on CBS aired this cyber uh, war episode. So hope this works, so I'm going to just give this a click. It's about uh, 60 seconds. Well, there's a little sound. You might want to explain what's happening. I hope you saw that. Did that work? I hope it did. But basically, it did. It did, it did work. We didn't get any of the uh, audio through, though. We saw the video. Oh, sorry. But yeah, there wasn't a lot of audio, so you didn't miss too much. 
but let me just explain. Um, uh, the, Aurora, the Aurora project proved that the network control to generators actually can be dangerous because it shows how this 27 ton, which is the weight of about 13 cars, um, that it can be destroyed by simply uh, hacking it, hacking into it from like a common laptop and pushing a key. Imagine getting access to all of the uh, generators in the U.S. What would we do without electricity for four months or even a year? This would cause uh, really a, a, a disruption in all businesses, resulting in chaos and, and in large areas of the U.S. So really, our IT engineers really need to care about these liabilities, not not just uh, profits. But it, in my view, even if they did, it's still too expensive because Microsoft makes billions of dollars and even they can't stop hackers. Now, with 7,200 industrial internet facing devices, perpetrators really have a lot of different opportunities to attack our infrastructure. These sites are really located, you can see like along the west coast, in the middle, and the east coast. It's really in the most populated areas that could do the most damage. What's really scary is that these sites are not aware of the threats and the vulnerabilities of their systems. Of course, this is getting better with this ICS CERT uh, involvement, but it's still not good enough. For example, uh, remarks at a recent security summit, two researchers uh, known for finding thousands of vulnerabilities in industrial control systems demonstrated the ease of hacking into Tritium's Niagara framework, which is, is, is a common framework that runs all of the building maintenance solutions around the globe. Industrial control, control systems really was once considered safe, but the recent advisories that I'm showing you here uh, that there are opportunities for hackers to exploit the industrial side just as much as on the commercial side. You can notice that all of these advisories are against solutions that are installed in the process control area, basically where we all work. If, if you don't do anything else, I recommend that you sign up for the ICS CERT magazine that documents vulnerabilities and solutions for better cybersecurity, and it, it uh, looks like this when you sign up for it. And basically it shows you uh, basically um, ads, uh, not ads, but uh, what's been going on, gives you the chart of how many incidents, it gives you uh, advisories about what you should do in certain things, and it's really a good summary of what's going on around the industrial uh, cybersecurity world. Now let's just talk a little bit about hazards, risks, and impacts. Uh, this, is, this is a chart from FEMA, and as you might know, FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They publish risk assessment processes, basically identify hazards, risks, and impacts that could happen. There are many hazards. You look on, on, this, on, on this side here and that cybersecurity is way on the bottom. But cybersecurity, I believe, is the most insidious since it causes many of the hazards above it, which is everything from fire explosion to outages, things like that. And it also affects all of the assets. All of these assets would be part of, would be at risk. And the impact of manufacturers like you can range from casualties to property damage to all of these things that keeps up CEOs at night. Most companies invest in mitigation strategies, but we think an ounce of prevention is the cure for a lot of these impacts. And that's what I'm going to be talking about later in this presentation. Okay. I'm going to talk about why software is not enough. But before I do that, I want to talk about a little bit about what uh, a basic 
systems that we have in our plant. So, so we have the basic process control system, which really continuously operates the process during plant normal and startup and running conditions. It also has SCADA supervisory control and data acquisition systems. And these are basically used more in remote applications like in pipelines and booster stations, things like that. On the other hand, you also have safety systems. And these safety systems, uh, the main function is to bring the plant to a safe state from a hazardous state. And these systems are tied to process safety uh, and equipment safety applications such as uh, motors and pumps and machinery, things like that. System suppliers have done a great job in providing performance, uptime, security at different control systems deployed. How, but, I, but I think that three factors are conspiring against their efforts. The, uh, the current iteration of control systems are more secure, but researchers have found that $65 billion worth of old systems are in dire need of modernization. And these are the old legacy systems. More wireless connectivity is adding more internet-facing devices to the internet, so there's more opportunity for them to hack. Digital encryption, one of the primary tools for wireless and control system safety, is not as safe as once thought. For example, NSA and the British government had actually unraveled the encryption technology using supercomputers. This was, of course, recently leaked by the former NSA contractor Edward Snowden. If you look at the systems that we currently use today, they're all open systems. And virtually every new uh, control system utilizes these systems such as Hart, Foundation, Field Bus, and Profit Bus, which connect from the field device level, down at the lowest level here, all the way through I.O. into the control and the supervisory level. Uh, which is, uh, goes also into the enterprise itself. Since more systems are being connected and networked for productivity's sake, increasing production, but they can also be hacked. If we look at some of the origins of the attacks, it comes from everywhere. It comes from employees, you know, and these employees could be ex-employees, it could be accidental, or from an ex-employee intentional, comes from contractors, terrorists, and the government, and other countries trying to do some malicious harm, competitors trying to find out a little bit more about what you're doing so that they can implement some of those things, and even high school and college students. So really, there's, there's just too many attackers to stop, from my opinion. And there's many reasons for concern because the prevention, as I said, is costly it, it, and it's 24-7 forever. You're never done. Savvy attackers. A lot of measures can be taken, but all of the experts have indicated there's really no guarantee. Maybe we should stay with the older legacy systems because they're proprietary, but open systems are vulnerable. All of the basic process control systems actually use Microsoft. Security protocols are smart, and the smart software help, but really experts agree you cannot prevent an attack. So I think really a second layer of security is prudent. And that's what really I'm going to talk about. And so I'm going to get into a little bit about some of the things that you can do, which is kind of like going back to the future in a way. But it's really, um, even though it, it's maybe somewhat uh, older technology and things like that, something we should consider. So first of all, what is hack-proof instrumentation? Hack-proof instrumentation is things that uh, doesn't have network capability, not even hard, and it functions alone without the connectivity. So really, it's a self-contained device that does something like maybe shut down something, all right, turn off something. And that's some of the things that we do here at United Electric Controls. And so what I'm showing you here is pressure and temperature switches. They come in a lot of different varieties, everything from weatherproof to um, 
has location. These are very inexpensive devices, maybe a maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars. These are a little bit more, maybe a few hundred dollars. These are a little bit more, where maybe beyond five hundred dollars. But we're talking about hazardous locations that are goes in class one, division one, division two, and they um, pretty much do one of two things. They shut off uh, something or an alarm under high, low pressure, high, low temperature. And one thing that I want to present to you, which you probably don't know too much of, is this whole concept of a transmitter switch. And so basically these are digital switches, but actually with a transmitter or vice versa. The whole point I'm making here is that they have zero communication, which means it's 100% hack proof from the web. Certainly you can go up to it and hack it, but you have to be within the physical confines of the plant. Looking at the one series, it, it basically has a switch output. It's simple, very simple. You know, anyone can work on these things. It doesn't have a display, inexpensive, reliable, it doesn't use any power. The concept of the transmitter switch it is that it has multifunctional capabilities where it has a gauge, it has a transmitter, it has a switch, and this switch can be looked at as being an on-off controller, if you will. And you can set that up to do things like that. Invol in included with this device is you have diagnostics, you have plug port detection so that uh, if you had, for example, impulse lines and you know that impulse lines get plugged, and if it's plugged, it will alert you that it's plugged and that someone needs to take a look at it. And it has two-wire connectivity with the programmability. And the programmability allows you to set the uh, thresholds for tripping and the dead band uh, independently of each other and, and all, all, all across the 100% of the range itself. Two-wire connectivity is uh, you can connect it right to a a PLC or a safety PLC without additional wires and power. Along the same lines are some benefits of uh, this the one series transmitter switch device is that it's really a three-in-one device. It has a switch, it has a transmitter, it has a gauge all in one. Of course what that does is it reduces leak paths, which is all of these here, reduces dead legs, because it's straight up, you don't have the dead legs that you have here. Reduces the instruments three to one. Labor costs of putting all that together into one. And of course the reliability that goes along with it. Now if, um, uh, if you have a safety system application, uh, the one series transmitter switch can be used in older legacy grandfathered safety systems or the new uh, safety instrumented system validated to the most recent standards of uh, IEC 61508. And using the failure mode effects diagnostic analysis, you can develop uh, a system for SIL2 or SIL3 or what have you. So if you look at our uh, tagline, our tagline is leaders in safety alarm and shutdown. These are the kinds of products that we have, and this is one of the higher level products for emergency alarm and shutdown. Just let's step back and take a look at a typical safety system components. And what you typically would see is, is a pressure transmitter, and, and that is the sensor portion. The transmitter also could be a switch, or also could be a transmitter switch and combined with a safety PLC, which is the logic solver, it, it determines um, basically where you want to trip something, open a valve or close a valve, and that runs, of course, oops, sorry. Uh, I don't want to do that. Oh, good. And, uh, and what, what that does is it trips or opens or close uh, a final control element. And, and that valve could close the flow or, or relieve a pressure in a vessel, or turn on a blow to evacuate toxic materials from a premises. If we look at the implementation scenarios for a, a one-series transmitter switch, uh, 
you don't need the logic solver here. It has its logic solver embedded within the unit itself, so you have a simplistic system where if you want to run a final control element, uh, it's all there for you. Reduces the time, total cost of ownership is much lower. It's even lower when when you set this up for a system for shutting down machinery such as a motor, it's all in one. The sensor, the logic solver, the final control element, which is the relay uh, that uh, opens and closes a motor starter, is all in that one device, all programmed, ready to go. Let's look at another implementation scenario. And here we have a, a lube oil pressure application. So lube oil just like in your car, you want oil pressure, and it has to be a minimum oil pressure. You're not going to get any lubrication. So the one series basically, as I said, provides dual functions. It monitors the process using the 4 to 20 milliamp signal and directing that to the DCS. The 4 to 20 generates a soft alarm, 1 and 2, that the DCS can see. Uh, and and it provides that before the process reaches uh, a critical abnormal condition. Now, if the soft alarms are not recognized by the DCS or the DCS is hacked by cybersecurity or what have you, or it fails in any way, uh, the built-in solid state relay right here uh, can shut down the process in an emergency before a catastrophe independent of the DCS. So that's that second layer of, uh, of safety for cybersecurity that I'm talking about. And note that this, this uh, uh, solid state relay is a much faster trip because you don't have to go through the DCS and the scans and all of that, that stuff so that you don't have a delay in response. A couple of things I want to talk about. Why would you want to use a transmitter switch in lieu of a pressure transmitter safety system? Really, I talked about this already. They work independently. They don't require any power. You can drop this in, into a PLC and not add anything. It, it really reacts in a few milliseconds. So I would say a, a one series is like 60 milliseconds, transmit is 100 milliseconds. And you would think that what's a few milliseconds? In, in talking to some of them, um, uh, major users of this device in PD pumps, for example, those few, few milliseconds will means that either you have a pump working or it's not working. The cost of electromechanical and digital switches are half the cost of a transmitter. So these transmitter switches drop in place, no switching costs if you wanted to do so. And of course, they are hack proof. So just looking at the benefits of these devices, it improves availability. And what that means is you don't have, it's cyber attack safe. Improve uptime. You have the diagnostic to let you know that it's not going to be working. And it improves safety with uh, the relay to ensure timely function of that safety function. It lowers inventory cost because it's a transmitter switch and a gauge in one. It eases the selection process with universal drop-in replacement in a safety system. Reduces the total cost, which is purchasing, commissioning, maintenance with simplicity of its design. And reduces the migration cost because it's backwardly compatible, or backwardly uh, uh, forward and backwardly compatible. Because older uh, safety systems are switches, it works as a switch. Newer safety systems are a transfer, works as a transmitter. Some of the typical applications I would just want to point out to you is uh, sensors for the process safety system, lube oil systems, seal monitoring systems is a big deal, standby pump protection, level control protection, heaters and fire protection, very big applications. And all of these things you need in, in an emergency. So where should you start? Uh, since I worked for the ARC advisory group uh, in my last life, uh, they allowed me to use this. And if you look at their uh, studies that they do on safety systems, uh, 
the amount of safety systems that are shipped every year, you can see that 40% is emergency safety shutdown. Uh, you can also see that uh, fire and gas and turbo machinery combine right out, right out the top three, and when you combine all of these three together, it's about 75% of the shipments that you have, which really correlates to somewhere around 50 to 60% uninstalled base. So really, I would focus on a critical emergency shutdown first because uh, that is the highest value target for uh, hackers and also would provide you the most criticality in, in your efforts. So recommendations, I want to close this up. So you, you, first thing you have to do is recognize you have a problem. I would work with ICS CERT. Consider minimizing networking. I know networking is a big deal today because it, 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 it allows a lot of productivity. Uh, it, it pulls a lot of the data. But in some cases, you might not maybe you shouldn't consider doing so and not even connect hard and critical loops. You might just consider using analog transmitters if, if you don't re really need the performance and, and uh, you can replace these transmitters with electromechanical switches for additional safety and even better yet replace with a one series transmitter si switch with the diagnostics that you get Deploy one series in safety instrumented systems. Migrate safety systems, pressure temperature transmitters to so suitable one series transmitter switches. And lastly, add on a one series transmitter switch as a second layer of defense because you don't want this to happen. You want to prevent the BP Texas refinery. You want to prevent the bunt fuel explosion. And hopefully, if it was if there was redundant systems, we could have re prevented the deep water horizon. So don't assume that IT is, is, is going to be successful and consider hack-proof instrumentation. I thank you for your, your attention. If you have any questions, here's my email, or you can contact Lesman for product information. Thank you very much. Will, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, as he said, if, if you do have any specific application questions, Feel free to give us a call here at Lessman as well. Our phone number is 800-9-LESSMAN or 800-953-7626. If you don't know your account manager, feel free to just call in and ask for me, Mike DeLaCluse, and I'll make sure you get taken care of. Uh, next month, our webinar is uh, going to be on the 29th of October at 9 a.m., and we're going to cover the evolution of butterfly valves. You'll learn about why they're applied in certain applications that range from the simple to the severe, including those applications where you have to have closure in very difficult applications. Uh, you'll see invitations come out on that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I don't see any questions from any of the attendees, so it's, at this point we will conclude our presentation. Uh, again, Will, thank you very much. Uh, that will conclude our presentation for the day.